my mom, she migrated to the U.S. in 1998. Um, first, she went to St. Croix, um, which is where my aunt lived, and then she moved to New York. Um, but unfortunately, um, in 2001, she was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Um, but I'm grateful that she was there because, you know, she was able to have some kind of life even while battling that. And she died in 2006. Um, she decided she wanted to come to a home. She said she wanted to die in her bed that she paid for. So in, two th in June 2006, she was, she was brought home and she died August 9th, 2006. That was my first, that was actually my first introduction to death. And that was, that was, uh, it took me a few years to, to um, accept that and deal with it because that happened. So you tell me my mother I've known all my life is not coming back. You know, so it, it, it was, it was something, it was something. Um, and you, you find ways to cope. Um, thankfully, um, I have people in my life, all the friends, um, all the persons I look up to as parents who were my village. So they all, they took care of me. They, you know, they were always there if I needed somebody. So that, that helped me a lot. And I think that's important. And I think that's what, that's what we need everywhere. We need that village, that support system. Moving, moving to North America has really opened my eyes to the fact that um, as much as we have issues in the Caribbean as a, as a whole, we do have some really good things going for us. And it is that village. Um, good or bad, we still, you know, there's a lot to learn from having that village. Um, just on a side note, today at church, a, an older gentleman, he fainted. And when the paramedics came in, they were asking me questions. Now, I know him on, just by first name, but I don't know anything about him outside of the church walls. And they were asking me a lot of questions about his health, his family, and, they, and I'm like, I don't know. But then I'm thinking if this had happened in a church in St. Lucia, we would have known his grandparents, his sister, his nephews, his cousin, his aunties. Aunt, they would have somebody in that church would have known something about him. And that that goes to our village type of community. But my, my mother was always tired, um, always working. Um, I guess that's a sacrifice of being a single mother, you know, working hard. Um, she was never one to rely on persons for stuff. Um, and to me, that's, you know, has its plus and minuses because now I think I can do it all without asking anybody for help. And that's, that's not okay. And it took me a while, many years to to get over that. And um, my ex-boyfriend's mother, who was, was a major part of my life, um, she taught me how to receive and ask for help, you know, um, by sharing her experiences and pushing me to do things. Um, she was always after me to move back to Canada because I had talked so fondly of it. And she was always pushing me and pushing me to do that. Um, but she just, she taught me a lot of lessons. So again, it goes back to the village and people in your life, how, however they may have entered your life, the, the effect and impact they had on your, on your life. And hers was in a very positive way. So when I lost my mother, she was very, she was very much there for me. And, um, she, she taught me, we spent a lot of time together. So she taught me a lot about how she dealt with things, um, um, and you saw things differently through someone else's eyes because one, um, she was a light skinned woman. Um, she would be considered white by some persons and she dealt with racism as well, even though she was an extremely nice lady and very accommodating and very kind and very helpful. But 
those who didn't know just thought she was this white woman and she was anything but and seeing it from her eyes learning her lessons and how she dealt with things changed me as a person so then i wasn't so quick with the responses and taught me how to like you know sometimes it's really not the person not what they're saying because what's coming out of their mouth and how they're reacting there is something else it's not the truth it's it's it's, it's fueled by something else so remove that and just respond in kind just be kind she has since passed on she has left me as well but again that's another life lesson um, I had to do it all the way up here. But I think I'm a very resilient person. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, I still, at, this, at that point, I still had my grandmother. She too has left me. <laughs> she died suddenly in 2019 from brain aneurysm. Um, so that was another one that shocked me. So, and j just a year and a half after her, her son, which is my dad, he died. Um, so you sit and you think about your life. Um, the one word that comes is gratitude. Are you um, close with your dad growing up? Unfortunately, no. Um, my dad was young. My dad had me when he was 20. And my dad was a young man. Who lived his life. Um, I knew where he worked, and my my um, primary infant primary school was not too far from where he he worked. So I I saw him every day. Um, I think our relationship changed as I got older, because um, I didn't see him as often, as opposed to when I went to infant and primary school, when I would just walk across and my dad was there, he was at work come and see him at lunchtime every day. Um, but I, I think the relationship dynamics always change as you progress into a different person or different stage in your life. Um, and if the parent has not made it, has not set the foundation for that, that close bond or relationship, it kind of cracks and kind of, you know, you just kind of go your separate ways. But he always knew where to find me, and I always knew where to find him. My father, he um, he was never mean to me or anything like that. So I don't know. It, it was not a terrible relationship. Um, unfortunately, I had to watch him take his last breaths last year, um, which, which was which is something I would never wish on anybody to see, to actually witness a parent expiring. Um, but as we say, his suffering is no more. Um, um, I think in the last year of his life, he, he realized that he made some mistakes and vocalized it. So um, maybe that's something fathers can now take note of that you do not let your time expire before you build a strong relationship with your kids. It is important, but there's no, there was no negative feeling towards my dad or anything like, I think maybe because he was always a very kind parent to me, even though he was, he was absent in the times that I met him or met up with him. He was, he was always kind. So I responded well to that. My riskiest move to me was one, coming to university on my own. I did that, I knew nobody. And then even riskier when I made a decision to migrate with no job, no home, nothing. So whew, when I moved here, at first I was scared. And in 2001, when I came for university, I was scared um, because I had never done something like this before. But then I started realizing I kind of like this little liberty, just being, you know, it's just freeness, free from judgment. You know, you can walk the street with whatever you want to wear, you know, just that kind of, you know, acceptance. 
Um, Halifax to me feels like Saint Lucia in some aspects, but it's a it's bigger than that. It's, it's kind of difficult to explain it, but I feel a sense of belonging here, even though it's different to my island. So I went back home. Um, I did have a relationship at that time, and so I still felt that you know this isn't for me. I can't stay here. You know, when I moved back home, I was feeling, oh, I, I can't do this for too long. <laughs> I, I feel as if I need to be back in Halifax, as strange as that sounded. Um, by that time, my mom was, was, was ill. Uh, my mom got diagnosed in 2001, literally a month after I arrived here for university. And it was a very trying time because it seemed as if every time I was ready for final, final exams, that's when my mom had a major surgery. So, and I don't know, I, I had grown in some way. I, I don't know what, but I had grown. I was different after this experience at university. And I knew it was only a matter of time that I would, I would leave. Um, and so I started thinking about it. And, and, and now I know that this is what they call manifesting. So every time I thought about Halifax, I, I felt this, this kind of jump in my stomach, I mean, sorry, in my chest, and um, this, this feeling that I, I, I need to come back. Um, and every year, the university would send um, the director of student services to do the um, university fair, the school fair, and I would assist for those two days. And he said, you need to come back to Halifax. You need to come back. And um, I was like, mm, I don't know. I was hemming and hawing about it. I went to the, the immigration website. I printed out all the documents that they, they wanted. Um, then I threw it out. And the thought came back again. Like, oh, I don't know. And I threw it out again. And then one day out of the blue, just out of the blue, the director of student services called me and he said, I don't know, Sharon, I've been thinking about you. What's going on? How's everything? You know, he just called to have a conversation. And I was at work at the time. And when I was done, I went to speak to my boss. I said, you know what? I think it's time. I think it's time I do this. And everything fell in place at that time. Everything fell in place. And it just worked out. I moved here, I literally had nothing. I came with everything I had. I left nothing back in St. Lucia. I had no job. It was a very scary time for me. Um, in St. Lucia, you know somebody, your friends know somebody who could give you a job. You know, you can find your way. Um, if you have no money, you could still eat. You could, you could still eat if you have no money in St. Lucia because this friend has a, a, a breadfruit tree. This friend has an extra hand of bananas. This person will pass by the supermarket and buy you some meat. This one will give you a plate of food or whatever. You know, or you could just eat mangoes all day. You know? Um, but here, you literally have to fend for yourself, for everything. And I had to stop romanticizing about my life at home, which I thought was hard. But when I realized it was pretty easy, that no, you don't have anybody to look after you now or help you. You got to do this by yourself. You have to figure things out. So I had to force myself to network. I'm still terrible at it, but I give myself grace for even attempting it. Yeah. And so... Um, at first I, I regretted it because I, like, I don't have a job and this and that. And this, you know, I got a temp job and it was like $11 an hour. I'm like, what is that? You know? Um, but you know, things get better. Things do get better. Um, I remember a couple of years ago when I was just really feeling down about a lot of things, my, a friend of mine in Australia, he said to me, hold up, hold up, hold up. Do you know what you just did? You moved to a whole country. A whole country. 
with no family, no friends, really, you move to a whole country by yourself. Just, just let that sink in. You will be okay. This is your rough patch, but you will be okay. So I had to appreciate myself for, for doing that, taking that step, making that decision, and surviving. Because I remember a time um, in my early 20s, I wanted to apply for a job in St. Kitts at the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. But I, I, I wrote up the application and did everything, and I just seized because, oh, my God, move to St. Kitts. Oh, my goodness. Why would I want to do that? That is scary. I don't know anybody in St. Kitts. And, and you had some of the older folks putting that fear in you. Um, who do you know there? So you just go into a place you don't know anybody. And it made it seem as if that's something so wrong and, and frightening when it's not. And so I started thinking about gratitude, things to be grateful for. I'm not putting down my country in any way, but I am just being grateful for one, the lessons that I learned growing up there. And two, the fact that I had the opportunity to move here, you know, uh, whereas it's so difficult for other persons. So I think this has been in my late stage of life. I think moving towards my fifties, this has been the most trying, um, the most important time of my life, I should say, because it has changed me into who I am. It's changed the person that I am. But growing up in St. Lucia was, it made you strong. It, it made you who you are. It made you who you are now, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, I think it prepared, it prepared me a lot for the outside world, meaning outside of the region, North America, because it gave you tough skin. So I think that maybe that's why this is the best season of my life because I've had to go through all these stages to come here to the realization of a lot of things about myself, who I am as a person, um, what I have to contribute, um, and sometimes it's not necessarily in monetary, um, but in terms of just being there, um, offering a kind word, and just, just being supportive.